Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Kim Hoppe, Associate Director of Communications and Public Affairs for Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Thank you all for coming out today. We invited you because we wanted to brief the community about when to seek care if your children are sick with H1N1 flu. Today's news conference is a group effort. We have experts from Johns Hopkins Hospital, University of Maryland Hospital for Children, Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Baltimore City Health Department. Starting to my left, Dr. Aaron Millstone, a pediatric infectious disease expert with Johns Hopkins Children's Center. We have um, Dr. Mitch Goldstein. He's a specialist in emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Dr. Kayvon Rafi is a chief of pediatric emergency medicine at the University of Maryland Hospital for Children, which is a part of the University of Maryland Medical Center. We have Dr. Lucy Wilson. She's the chief for the Center of Surveillance, Infection Prevention, and Outbreak Response with the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And Dr. Ann Bailowitz is Acting Chief Medical Officer for the Baltimore City Health Department. Dr. Millstone will begin with some comments and then we'll open the floor to questions um, for all of today's experts. And you all should have gotten a handout on the way in. If you didn't, um, this includes a guide for parents. Let us know on your way out and we'll make sure you guys get them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Millstone. Thank you, thank you for coming. As expected, we have seen an increase in the number of cases of H1N1 in the Baltimore area in the last few weeks. Uh, we recognize and understand that parents and individuals are concerned. Uh, we are hoping to reassure people and provide some guidance as to what they can do if, if either they or their child uh, or they think they have, might have H1N1. The good news is that this H1N1 virus is behaving similarly to other seasonal flu strains we've seen in the last couple years. And most people out there in the public have had influenza before. Um, you feel lousy, you get a high fever, headache, sore throat, body aches, you don't want to get out of bed. Um, and this is behaving the same way. Uh, some people with this virus do have stomach upset, but overall the symptoms are very similar. Uh, fortunately, most people have a speedy recovery by doing simple things like getting a lot of rest, drinking lots of fluids and staying hydrated, and taking either Tylenol or Motrin to reduce fever. If you think you have influenza, when would you want to seek uh, medical help? When would you want to see a doctor? Most people do not need to go to the doctor or go to the hospital if they have influenza. Some people should consider it. People that are very young, are very old, pregnant women, or people who have certain underlying medical conditions, things like asthma, diabetes, um, should talk to their doctor either in advance to find out when they should call, or if you think you have flu, call your doctor and, and find out whether or not you should be evaluated. Um, in addition to hand hygiene and cough etiquette, so coughing into your sleeve, vaccination remains an important component of um, influenza, preventing influenza infections. Um, children are a priority group for the flu shot or the flu vaccine for H1N1, and this vaccine will become available soon and distributed through the state. So please stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, other people that should consider seeking immediate attention are those who are having trouble breathing, chest pain, or difficulty staying hydrated. If you're having what you would think is a medical illness or a medical emergency, um, it is reasonable to seek medical attention urgently. We have been dealing indeed with that. Uh, we have been reaching out through the Baltimore City Public School System to address that and to bring some comfort to parents uh, to share with them that basically the vast majority of cases do uh, really quite well. The disease is mild to moderate. Um, it's the exception to the rule that someone is hospitalized. Uh, we've been emphasizing the need to be vaccinated and that right now we have the seasonal flu vaccine but uh, also happily we've just received the H1N1 flu mist um, and we're rolling that out actually. Uh, we just began uh, we began our efforts at the city health department uh, today with health care workers, and we're going to be offering that to 2 to 24-year-olds uh, very shortly. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to be an, an important uh, source of relief. In fact, we're going to be having a clinic at Poly Western High School uh, on October 15th from noon to 8 
uh, where children two through 24 years of age will be able to receive the H1N1 flu mist. Additionally, uh, we're seeing influenza throughout the state of Maryland, so it's widespread. All of our surveillance indicators show that it's throughout the state in all jurisdictions, and so we expect it to be in the community and in schools. So teaching kids about hand hygiene, washing their hands is very important and involving the school in that. Additionally, the message to families to keep their kids home if they're sick and for parents to stay home from work if they're sick to help prevent is one of the ways that people can protect themselves aside from the vaccine, which we're expecting to be available to many people shortly. Um, another principle that is important for us uh, as a center of uh, pediatric care is appropriate management of chronic underlying conditions. So especially asthma, which is very prevalent in the Baltimore inner city community, but nationwide as well. It is important, of course, to follow the hand hygiene and uh, preventative measures that are being discussed, but appropriate control of the chronic underlying disease will help to moderate the acute illness or any exacerbations that may ensue from any exposure to any viral infection, but H1N1 being one of the many that can trigger the acute exacerbation. So our job is, of course, to attend to the acute illness, but also make sure that the chronic underlying illnesses, the preventative aspects of care, are followed as well in anticipation of exposure, which is uh, invariable. Children in the schools, when they interact, many illnesses spread, and most children do perfectly well with it. It's important to be prepared for that and to anticipate exposure such as that and make sure children who are at higher risk, children with acute, uh, for chronic lung disease or other chronic medical conditions are well controlled uh, and can uh, endure the illness uh, uh, better. I, I think the point to be made is that routine hygienic measures that the regular janitorial staff are taking are adequate to address this issue. Uh, you know, the typical approach to cleaning desks, doorknobs, et cetera, keeping the floors clean, the bathrooms clean, ensuring that there's a, you know, abundant soap, paper towels, et cetera, in the bathrooms, all of those should be routine. Uh, this, this concept of, you know, totally scrubbing down the school uh, really, I, I, I think, is a bit overstated. Uh, routine, regular cleansers um, addressing the basics uh, work very well and also particular attention to ensuring that there's adequate, you know, soap in the bathrooms, paper towels, et cetera, the trash cans are empty so dirty tissues are, are not in there. Uh, desktops and doorknobs are wiped down, cafeteria surfaces, et cetera. But, but those should, in, you know, in a well-maintained school, be routine and not the exception. It is also important, as we do in the emergency department, the pediatric emergency department, to put things in, in, in context. Uh, in, the, uh, in the general population, more than 99% of the population do perfectly well with the illness, have fever, uh, uncomfortable symptoms, no doubt, but uh, get through the illness perfectly well. Um, one of the, uh, to, in order, certainly many families are concerned about mortality, about deaths in young children that are being uh, highlighted. But when I discuss this with families that come to our emergency department, I mention to them that there are many uh, individuals who succumb to motor vehicle accidents uh, driving down 95. Doesn't mean we all stop driving down 95. You take reasonable precautions. You put your seatbelt on and you, you drive within the speed limit and you do perfectly well. So even though there are individuals who have uh, horrible outcomes and we certainly feel for the, them, them and their families, we have to keep in mind that most individuals do perfectly well as long as reasonable precautionary measures are taken. I think the other thing to, to highlight for families, I think when the schools send out that there has been a confirmed case, um, I think that engenders some anxiety for folks. And I think what's important to recognize is that this, as was stated, is, is out there. And the notion of whether or not an individual school has a confirmed case or not should not engender any more anxiety in that school than any other school. And that the same sort of common sense uh, measures that I think families can do to sort of, you know, if your child is sick, don't send them to school and, you know, uh, adhere to the appropriate um, um, uh, hygiene measures that have been discussed, but whether or not a school has a confirmed case shouldn't engender more anxiety for a family and that they feel the need to flock to medical care just because of that confirmation in the school.